Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn now to Iowa, where two Catholic workers have revealed they secretly carried out multiple acts of sabotage and arson in recent months in order to stop construction of the controversial $3.8 billion Dakota Access Pipeline. Jessica Resnicek and Ruby Montoya said that on Election Day last year, they set fire to five pieces of heavy machinery being used to construct the pipeline. The two then taught themselves how to destroy empty pipeline valves and moved up and down the pipeline's length, destroying the valves and delaying construction for weeks. They say their actions were inspired by the anti-nuclear plowshares movement, which used nonviolent direct action to target nuclear warheads and military installations. On Monday, they spoke out outside the Iowa Utilities Board office. This begins with Jessica Resnicek. We are speaking publicly to empower others to act boldly, with purity of heart, to dismantle the infrastructures which deny us our rights to water, land and liberty. We as civilians have seen the repeated failures of the government, and it is our duty to act with responsibility and integrity, risking our own liberty for the sovereignty of us all. Some may view these actions as violent, but be not mistaken. We acted from our hearts and never threatened human life nor personal property. What we did do was fight a private co corporation that has run rapidly across our country, seizing land and polluting our nation's water supply. And that was Ruby Montoya, along with Jessica Resnicek, speaking Monday. After delivering their statement, the two used a hammer and crowbar to try to pull off the letters of the Iowa Utilities Board sign in protest of its recent decision to reject a lawsuit by environmental groups to revoke the pipeline's state permit and force it to shut down. The women were arrested and jailed overnight for destroying the sign and are now facing possible arrest at any time for committing multiple acts of sabotage. I spoke to Jessica Resnicek and Ruby Montoya earlier this week, I began by asking Ruby to talk about what they did and why they're coming forward now. So on an election night, we uh, went to a dapple easement site in Buena Vista County, and we saw over six or seven pieces of heavy machinery there, and we went with our supplies. And we filled these coffee canisters up with gasoline and oil. Uh, we placed those coffee canisters on the inside of the cabs of these heavy machinery, uh, on, on the seats, and we pierced those coffee canisters so that uh, the flammable liquids would spread. We then lit matches and uh, in efforts to make those machines obsolete. Uh, we acted after having exhausted all other avenues of political process and uh, resistance to this petroleum pipeline that, to my knowledge, is the largest in the United States as far as uh, the capacity that it is able to carry the oil. Jessica Resnicek, how did you know where this pipeline was? Well, I knew exactly where this pipeline was because it goes. It's it's not more than 15 miles from this studio. It runs right here through the the the, the county I was born in, Polk County, Iowa. Um, I definitely took a lot of inspiration from what I saw up at Standing Rock. Um, but Iowa is impacted um, greatly by this, and our and my home city's drinking water um, is to be destroyed when this when this pipeline breaks. And um, so it's not a matter of uh, having to find it. It's right. It found me. So the investigation into the damage to the pipeline has been ongoing. But apparently, the authorities did not have leads into um, who committed um, these um, acts of sabotage. So, Jessica, why did you decide, you and Ruby, decide to come forward on Monday? Well, um, I guess uh, one of the main reasons is. Ruby and I felt uh, very uh, disheartened by the fact that oil is now flowing through the pipeline. Obviously, we cannot pierce through empty valves anymore. They are not empty. Um, we halted construction uh, up and down the line for several weeks, um, turn, turned, turning into months. And um, we're now at the phase where we have to deal with the reality that this pipeline, that we failed, um, as, as, our, as resistance here in Iowa goes. And um, 
and now oil's flowing through it, and there and there's really nothing more to do now than come forward and let the public know that, uh, and continue this public discourse about what that means, um, where we're heading, and uh, the consequences of it. Ruby, you talked about beginning this action of sabotage on election night. Why the significance of this day, election day, and then talk about what happened in the ensuing weeks, what exactly you did? Well, election day, it was very serendipitous. Uh, we, it, it just happened by coincidence. Uh, I remember the next day uh, we were uh, with the Mississippi, can, uh, Mississippi Stand caravan, and uh, other comrades had crawled into the Dakota Access Pipeline and occupied it for over 15 hours, at least. Uh, so I remember showing up there at the Des Moines River boring site and uh, still being elated by the action that we took the previous night, because we knew that uh, through the actions of Mississippi Stand, they had uh, halted the boring process temporarily, and uh, through the actions that Jessica and I took the evening prior, uh, we had also halted construction temporarily. Uh, so that felt really great, and we saw the effectiveness of these peaceful means to take uh, fire and other materials to these empty structures of metal uh, to disable them so that they could not continue their process of destruction. Uh, as time went on, we saw that uh, construction continued and that pipe was being put into the ground. And uh, so our only viable means was to somehow obstruct this pipe. And that material is made of steel, uh, 5 8 inch steel, and we had to figure out something that would melt it or somehow make it obsolete. So we began to look for things that would cut through uh, that amount of steel, and that turned out to be uh, oxygen and acetylene, which burns uh, at, a, like, over 2,000 degrees, and that melts uh, steel. So, after acquiring that knowledge, we proceeded and found many empty valves. Uh, all of the valves were empty. And we began uh, first in Mahaska County, Iowa, piercing through a valve there. And uh, later, we continued uh, until we ran out of supplies, hitting multiple valve sites. So what are the significance of these valves? What do they do? They are access points to shut off the flow of oil. So uh, I know that uh, that occurred with a group uh, up in the tar sands area of Alberta, Canada. Uh, so you can physically shut these valves off if there is oil in them, but since there was not oil in them, uh, this is the part of the pipeline that is exposed. Uh, the rest is underground and underneath our waterways. So with this steel exposed, instead of having to operate a bulldozer and try to dig it up, uh, it was easier to uh, find these exposed valves and cut underneath the seams of these valves, because these valves have seams. And if you cut underneath uh, the seams, it it's a lot more uh, effective in terms of them having to dig it up further and uh, costing them more money and more time and uh, pushing back that completion date until uh, our goal was for them to exhaust their financial means so that they would stop uh, with this pipeline. Now, Jessica Reznicek, uh, there are many who would say that destroying uh, private property like this is violence. Your response to this? I completely disagree. Um, I think that this, the, the, the oil being taken out of the ground and the machinery that, that does it and the infrastructure which supports it, that th this is violent. Um, this is vi these, these tools and these mechanisms that industry and corporate, uh, corporate power and, and government power and we're all colluded together and cr to create. Uh, th this is destructive, this is violent and it needs to be stopped. And um, 
And uh, we never at all threatened human life. Uh, we never at all act, and actually, we were we uh, we're, we're acting in an effort to save human life, to save our planet, to save our resources, um, and uh, and nothing at any point was ever done by Ruby nor I, and an, uh, anything outside of peaceful, uh, deliberate, and steady, loving hands. Can you explain what Plowshares actions are? For those who don't know, you are both Catholic workers, Jessica and Ruby, uh, living at the Catholic Worker House in Des Moines. Can you explain what the Catholic Worker Movement is all about? So we have a rich tradition uh, started by Dorothy Day um, in the 1930s. Um, and we have a rich tradition both in um, assisting underprivileged people in our communities via uh, soup kitchens, hospitality, shelters uh, for homeless people who we live with in our communities. And we also have, um, on the flip side of that, we also recognize uh, the resistance that is needed to uh, help bring underprivileged people back up to the same level as, uh, as, uh, as the people who are taking the money from them. Um, and so, in essence, uh, Ruby and I focus on the resistance aspect here in the Des Moines Catholic Worker, and uh, we uh, we have followed suit, and I believe that we're uh, we're inspired by Mr. Phil Berrigan, um, the house that we live in is named after, and um, and we do understand the need to dismantle infrastructure when it poses a threat to human life and liberty. So let me talk about and ask you about that tradition of the Berrigan brothers, of Father Dan Berrigan and Philip Berrigan, who helped launch the international anti-nuclear plowshares movement. Father Dan and seven others poured blood and hammered on warheads at a GE nuclear missile plant in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, in 1980. I asked Father Dan Berrigan about this during an interview I did with him around, oh, a decade ago. We went in with the workers at the changing of the shift and found there was really no security worth talking about. Uh, very easy entrance. In about three minutes, we were looking at doomsday. The weapon was before us. It was an unarmed warhead about to be shipped to Embro, Texas, for its payload. So it was a harmless weapon as of that moment. And uh, we, we cracked the weapon. It was very fragile. Uh, it was made to withstand the heat of reentry into the atmosphere from outer space. So it was like eggshell, really. And we had taken as our motto the great statement of Isaiah 2, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. So we did it, poured our blood around it, and stood in a circle. I think reciting the Lord's Prayer until Armageddon arrived, as we expected. And of course, Father Dan Berrigan and his brother Philip Berrigan and others, the Catonsville Nine in uh, 1968, uh, burned the draft files of um, uh, people in Catonsville, Maryland, uh, using napalm that was used in Vietnam. Do you consider this uh, yeah, we, a plowshares action? It has been characterized by Ruby and I as what uh, we call a, a rolling plowshares, yes. An extended plowshares action, yes. At the end of your statement on Monday, and you were standing in front of uh, Iowa Utilities Board office, can you explain its significance and why you then turned around and started ripping off the metal letters from that sign as the, um, uh, as the police moved in to arrest you? Uh, the Iowa Utilities Board uh, here in Iowa granted the Dakota Access uh, LLC permits uh, using eminent domain uh, as a public utility for this pipeline. Uh, so the company was allowed by the Iowa Utilities Board to come and seize land uh, from farmers to put this petroleum pipeline underneath their fields. Uh, so the Iowa Utilities Board here in Iowa was key 
uh, because Dakota Access Pipeline and Energy Transfer Partners were able to sidestep uh, the legal requirement of an environmental impa impact statement. So each state had its governing body to either grant or deny these permits uh, to build this pipeline. And here in Iowa, that was the Iowa Utilities Board. Uh, and it was granted under the guise, under the lie, of a public utility. Uh, and this past Friday, they released another decision, yet again doing the wrong thing, uh, and uh, ruling in favor of the Dakota Access Pipeline and Energy Transfer Partners. So that's why we were there. Uh, there have been many uh, protests, vigils, hunger strikes. Uh, in front of that building, with no response, uh, public commentary hearings with no response from this board. Uh, Jerry Hooser, who's the head of this board, it's a three-person board, she's actually under investigation for corruption. Uh, and so the list goes on and on as to why the Iowa Utilities Board is culpable in the uh, allowance of the Dakota Access Pipeline to come through Iowa. So we couldn't have picked a better place uh, to release our statement, and uh, with trying to remove all of the letters from the Iowa Utilities Board, uh, we don't feel that they represent Iowans, or, nor do they have their best interests in mind. Uh, clearly, time and time again, they are siding with these oil companies uh, because of corruption. And, Ruby, overall, the Dakota Access Pipeline, what it means to you? Did you and Jessica go to the resistance camps at the time of the last year, during the height of the resistance? I actually met Jessica on the Mississippi River. Uh, prior to that, I was a preschool teacher in Boulder, Colorado, and I found out about the Dakota Access Pipeline. I read about what they were intending to do uh, to put these dirty petroleum pipes underneath uh, our major waterways here in the United States, and uh, I was aghast by their intentions. So I quit my job, and I went to Standing Rock, and I was— uh, greatly comforted by the amount of people that were there, uh, the amount of helping hands, uh, ready to do resistance work and community work. And uh, I was following the Dakota Access Pipeline so closely uh, that I found out about Jessica Resnicek uh, starting an encampment on the Mississippi River bore site. And I went there because I knew that there were not a lot of people there. Jessica, how did you get involved with the Catholic Worker Movement? I, I met the Catholic workers. They were uh, when d here in Des Moines, where, uh, when they were at the forefront of the uh, the local Occupy movement um, uh, happening here at the Iowa State Capitol. Um, originally, I, I I I quit college. I dropped out of college and went to Zuccotti Park to Occupy in New York. I uh, received a call from a uh, close cousin of mine here in Des Moines and said, hey, they're occupying Des Moines. Right now, uh, was well, something like 30-some people just got arrested yesterday. And so I, I came back to Des Moines and uh, got plugged in to every, all the organizing that was going on here um, around uh, the caucuses at the time. There was a lot happening here. Um, and time and time again, I, I, I looked at who were, who were the key uh, leadership roles in that movement, although there was a leaderless movement, I would say. Um, but uh, it was the Catholic workers, and I thought, oh, I should really check, check these folks out. And I started, and I came, uh, started volunteering at the house. We, we, we have a soup kitchen that's open five days a week, and um, uh, began to volunteer five days a week, uh, moved in, and uh, just have, uh, really, it's been quite the journey ever since. So at this point, you have not been charged with anything but pulling off the letters of the sign where you were on Monday when you made your statement. That is correct, yeah. That is correct. However, while we were incarcerated overnight for that criminal mischief charge, we did have federal agents uh, 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 pull us out of our cells individually, one at a time, and uh, to address the statement, Ruby and I, of course, uh, said that we did not want to cooperate or, or communicate with them, and we were then released back into our cells. Um, so, it has—I mean, they have let us know that they are aware. 
That was Jessica Resnicek and Ruby Montoya, two Catholic worker activists who admitted earlier this week to carrying out multiple acts of sabotage against sections of the Dakota Access Pipeline that were under construction in Iowa. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. When we come back, we look at immigration and undocumented immigrants who were arrested. Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, is currently in El Salvador. Stay with us.